Hi, Jonathan. How's it going over there today? Hey, QBeth, it's going well. I can see that you are ready for our first coffee talks with a hot beverage. What is that in your hand? Well, I made myself an espresso this morning. Oh, okay. <laughs> well, I want you to know that I came prepared as well. I don't have anything that fancy, but I do have uh, one of my K-Cup creations. So I'm ready to get going. Wonderful. So let's get this thing started, Jonathan. If you could start us off with some of the house rules. Perfect. Let's do that. This is our very first coffee talks. Let's go over a couple of the house rules uh, and then we'll get right into it. So first of all, today's uh, broadcast, uh, everyone will be muted for this, uh, all of the attendees that is. And if you have questions, you can go ahead and email those questions in to newborn at usdtl.com. Once again, that's newborn at usdtl.com. And then the second thing is, we're just gonna have a short survey ready for you at the end. Just two questions. The first is, what do you wanna see from future Coffee Talks? And the next one is, what are the drugs of concern in your area? So just be aware of that. Um, by way of introduction, Kibeth and I both work at USDTL. We are business development managers there, and we have the pleasure of traveling all across the country, talking to perinatal teams, speaking with nurse managers, nurse educators, lab directors, and just sharing with them what the latest is in newborn drug testing and listening to the challenges that they're facing in this realm as well. So Kibeth, do you want to talk to us about what's on the agenda for today? Sure. So today we will be diving a little deeper into two peer-reviewed articles that was developed by Dr. Sean Loudon and his team that we do believe will be beneficial to our audience today. Uh, speaking about gabapentin and how gabapentin usage has evolved. Um, pressing issues at hand and I'm really excited because I think our audience will benefit from this. Beautiful, beautiful. So to get started with that, Kia Beth, why don't we talk a little bit about neonatal abstinence syndrome, what it is. Um, mm -hmm. So just to define it, neonatal abstinence syndrome is what happens when a baby has been exposed to opiates in utero. So if mom has been taking opiates, uh, it gets in her bloodstream, baby gets exposed and develops a dependency to these drugs, but when baby is born and is now cut off from the baby's bloodstream, that baby starts withdrawing from those drugs. And those set of symptoms is called neonatal abstinence syndrome. Kibeth, I know that we have some statistics from the CDC prepared just to kind of highlight, you know, how big of a problem this is. Can you share that with us? Yes, as you can see on the screen with us today, according to CDC, maternal opioid use disorder rates have more than quadrupled from 1999 all the way up to 2014. Also, according to the National Institute of Drug Abuse, every 15 minutes, a baby is born to neonatal abstinence syndrome. So unfortunately, this is a growing problem. We don't see this uh, declining anytime soon. And it's just a very sad situation. Very sad, very alarming uh, statistics there. So Kibeth, let's talk a little bit about what these withdrawal symptoms are and how it affects babies. So when a baby is withdrawing, um, usually this is marked by irritability, by sensitivity to all types of stimulation, whether that be noises or light or touch. Um, baby may have a hard time suckling uh, and feeding, a hard time sleeping be very hard to, you know, console, have a high pitched, you know, cry. So these types of things can really be disruptive in baby's early development. And this is why it's so important. But Kibeth, I know that you spent some time in West Virginia volunteering at an infant recovery center. Can you kind of walk us through what that experience was like and what you saw while you were there? Sure. You know, as you were speaking, Jonathan, it brought me back to that very first day when I went to Lily's place in West Virginia, and I was able to experience firsthand what a neonate looks like when they are withdrawing from drugs. There was one thing hearing about it, reading about it, but to actually experience that and 
see these babies um, was truly heartbreaking. And a lot of the withdrawal symptoms that I did see was what you were speaking about. But there was one neonate in particular that I recall I was actually uh, holding. And I was informed that this neonate was withdrawing not only from heroin, but also of gabapentin. Mm. So this was the first time it was brought to my attention that uh, gabapentin was used in conjunction with uh, heroin because it helped to potentiate the high of these moms. Mm. So some of these withdrawal symptoms I saw were definitely atypical withdrawal symptoms. Um, adding on to what you mentioned, when a neonate is withdrawing from gabapentin and uh, an opiate, you see uh, that their tongue, start, their tongue starts to thrust. They have a lot of wandering eye movement and back arching. So it's definitely heartbreaking to see these little ones withdrawing in such a manner. So if we could dive into Jonathan, I know we are going to speak about the atypical withdrawal with uh, Dr. Yes. Sean Jonathan. So if we could pull up that peer reviewed article on the screen so our audience could see. Um, so talking about this article, uh, some statistics that were alarming to me was that it showed in two of their studies that 22% of patients were using opiates in conjunction with gabapentin. In a third study, they talk about that now this time it was 26% of individuals that were addicted to opioids also abused gabapentin. So we're definitely seeing this to be alarming numbers as we can see. And something that they did mention towards the end of the article was that they fear that gabapentin may have been underestimated because of the fact that they relied solely on maternal use history. And as we know, oftentimes the moms may not really say what they were using due to the stigma that's out there and the fear of what they'll be judged. So yeah. if gabapentin could have been uh, detected on the neonates during this study, I think it would have made great progress. Yes, yeah. Yeah, Kia Beth. And that study led to a second study, uh, which was identifying co-exposure to gabapentin and opiates, uh, you know, for use during pregnancy. And Dr. Loudon's team decided that to tackle the issue of self-report being so unreliable that they were going to screen all of the moms uh, for gabapentin use as well as opiate use. And what they found was that indeed the incidence of moms with, with co-exposure uh, or co-use of gabapentin and opiates did go up statistically um, when they did universal screening. So they were able to identify more instances of this. But really what the most encouraging information from this was, if we can bring up this table here, keep it, they were able to reduce the length of stay for these babies who were co-exposed from 57.6 days all the way down to 47.9 days. So almost a 10 day difference by identifying early and initiating a gabap uh, gabapentin specific treatment and they were also able to initiate this treatment um, at 14 and a half days, which is down from 20.4 days previously. So when they knew that gabapentin was involved, they were able to start the treatment earlier, uh, uh, you know, almost a week earlier. And that translated into babies being in the hospital for almost 10 days less. Kia Beth, I thought that that was amazing. That was powerful and important, you know, for these babies, for their families, for everyone really who's involved uh, in the birth, you know, this new life that's, that's coming uh, into the world. I thought that was amazing. And I'm really extremely proud um, of, you know, this study and what they've been able to discover. I thought it was exciting. Yeah, I agree. You know, as you were speaking about the reduction in length of stay and the progress they made, it made me really think about the impact this has done on mom and baby and also on the hospital financially with reducing that cost of length of stay. Uh, a great article and great elaboration on that, Jonathan. As you were speaking, it brought me back to the Dartmouth conference. Uh, do you remember back in November when we attended this conference? 
Yeah. Yeah. So as you were speaking, I remember that one of the providers was sharing with us how the e-sleep console model is gaining popularity amongst multiple hospitals throughout the United States. And with this eat sleep console model, it promotes a reduction in pharmacological treatments. So I remember them speaking about, you know, this reduction in pharmacological treatment, but one of the providers did mention to us that he was starting to see neonates withdrawing from gabapentin. So this idea of the reduction of pharmacological treatment really put a shift in their way of strategizing how to move forward with these neonates because he mentioned that if a baby was exposed to gabapentin, it almost always requires pharmacological treatment. Yes. Yeah. yeah. So I think it's important, you know, to identify on the front end, was this neonate exposed to gabapentin or not? So like that, they know, okay, do I use the e-sleep console model or do we need to, you know, transition to another method? Yes. Yeah. I remember that specifically as well. You know, two of my takeaways from that presentation, I remember that that speaker, you know, uh, the doctor who presented saying when he becomes aware that gabapentin is involved, he cringes because of the severity of that withdrawal profile. Um, he, he, he was saying that it's even more severe than the withdrawal profile from, from heroin. So, um, you know, it, it, it really just enhances, you know, this discovery that, that we see here of how important it is to be able to identify this because those babies need uh, a gabapentin specific treatment. Uh, and that has made a huge difference uh, in Dr. Loudon's patients already. Kibeth, I have to say that I am really excited for our R&D team. I'm very proud of what they accomplished because when they became aware of this information, they went back into the lab and they developed a test for yeah. gabapentin in umbilical cord tissue testing so that this could be available for providers um, to, to make a difference. And I'm really happy for that. We introduced that earlier this year. Uh, and just last month, uh, we were very surprised to find that the positive rate for gabapentin exceeded the positive rate for even methamphetamine last month in yeah. the lab. And we never would have uh, predicted that, I don't think. But it just goes to show that this is a problem that is just now being really identified, um, but it's out there. It's out there and it can make a difference for these neonatals, uh, ne neonates' lives. And that's exciting. Right. You know, Jonathan, this pretty much wraps up our first Coffee Talks. We're coming to an end. So just wanted to tell everyone out there who tuned in to us today, thank you so much for taking time to sit with Jonathan and I in our first uh, Coffee Talks. We do look forward to you attending upcoming Coffee Talks. And Jonathan, it was a pleasure uh, doing this with you today. It's always great to talk with you, Kia Beth. Thank you so much. Enjoy the rest of your Java and we will see you next time. All right, bye. Bye.
Like and subscribe to our channel to receive notifications about new videos.